Welcome to Free Thoughts from Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute. I'm Aaron Powell. I'm Trevor Burris. And today we're joined by our colleague Christopher A. Preble. He's Vice President for Defense and Foreign Policy Studies here at the Cato Institute. As we sometimes do on Free Thoughts, we'll ask easy or obvious or potentially just dumb questions um, with the first one being like, what is foreign policy? I mean we have – is it just anything that has to do with other countries? We have trade policy people here and we have the global liberty and prosperity people. So what makes right. foreign policy different from what other people are doing? Well, it's not a stupid question. Um, I'm glad you asked the, uh, because I see foreign policy in my narrow sense of the term, that is my job and the people who I work with um, in my corner of the Cato Institute is the US government's interactions with other governments and people. And this is crucial because U.S. foreign policy is actually more than that and that includes trade and international development um, and kind of the spread of ideas that is primarily and I think many libertarians would agree should not really be the role of the U.S. government, right? The U.S. government has certain responsibilities to protect American security to advance the interests of the country and so its interactions, its formal interactions with other governments all fall in the realm of foreign policy or diplomacy. Right? Diplomacy is another way to describe this. But I do think that ignoring the other aspects of a country's foreign policy that, that are not conducted by the government is a, real, is a real mistake, is a real problem. And I think that a lot of the times when people uh, – kind of misconstrue or, or uh, don't fully understand what uh, Cato's approach to foreign policy is, is. They ignore the other things that we expect uh, uh, people to do, government uh, businesses to do, individuals, et cetera, which in a, in a broader sense really is foreign policy but it's not the U.S. government's foreign policy. Uh, is there a libertarian foreign policy? A lot of people think that libertarians have a pretty predictable uh, – almost pacifist. We get accused of a lot of things. So is there one libertarian foreign policy? I don't think there is one libertarian foreign policy. I do think that because war is the health of the state, the cliché, because the cliché happens to be true, um, I think that libertarians tend to be more skeptical of warfare than others. Now, you could argue that everyone's skeptical of warfare or virtually everyone. Um, but I think that there's a pretty clear kind of philosophical, logical train that says libertarians are, are less uh, inclined to go to war because they see the growth of the state during times of war and uh, others who are not libertarians uh, might share the, the object of kind of peace. Uh, but they see some of the consolidating effects of war uh, and growing the power of the state as sort of a salutary sort of by byproduct. And of course they would rarely uh, go forward and, and make a case uh, for war on those terms. But they don't look at the side effects of war uh, in the same way that we do as, as generally a bad thing. Because the, the fact is the US government or any government grows during wartime and very rarely uh, returns those powers to the states and the people when the war ends. Um, so that's a pretty a pretty common uh, thread that connects libertarian foreign policy over many, many years. When you say it grows and doesn't return those powers, what kinds of growth, what kinds of powers are we talking about? Well, just in a very in a very broad sense, the people become um, accustomed to government playing a larger role during wartime and then sort of accept uh, what would previously have been seen as intrusions or abridgments of their freedom and liberty uh, and sort of come – just sort of become acclimated to it. I think that you mentioned the war is the health of the state and uh, I think that's an interesting way of, of sort of expounding upon the way we look at foreign policy. What, what do you what, – what does that actually mean, unpacking the sure. war is the health of the state? Well, well at its most basic level um, – States, nation states, governments exist to wage war or at least to prevent uh, security threats or to, to reduce security threats. And so if you go back to the – you know, where governments grew up over in human history, it was a security function above all else. Um, and so when um, 
and when they exercise that power, when they are – whether it's a legitimate exercise or whether it's merely sort of for show as, a, as an excuse again to grow their power, um, they get larger. They, uh, they become uh, more capable. They acquire more resources, uh, taxes and people and, and whatnot. Um, I mean there are so many serious instances of this. The, th the few cases that I like to cite are – uh, you know the growth of taxation during wartime in the United States. Uh, Milton Friedman uh, uh, was responsible for federal income tax withholding when he was working for the federal government in 1942 or 43 um, uh, to make it easier for the federal government to raise money uh, through income taxes, which prior to that time uh, impacted a very small number of Americans. The there was a federal income a federal excise tax imposed on long distance telephone calls to pay for the Spanish American War. Uh, that war uh, lasted about six months. The excise tax lasted about 100 years. <laughs> so I mean – and there are many, many other cases. But I do think – and so those individual cases you can cite and it's sort of, a, it's sort of funny. But the bigger picture is, is even more important. I mean Bruce Porter who wrote I think quite a good book called War and the Rise of the State points out that the non-military uh, spending – during World War II by the federal government, by the U.S. federal government, rose faster than spending during the New Deal, right? So, so yes, of course, most people focus on the enormous increase in military expenditures that occurred during World War II for obvious reasons and obviously the federal government as a whole grew much – you know, grew dramatically during those period – during those years. Um, but again, we accepted a level of government – Taxation and spending that that prior to that time would have just been unheard of, and in, in, you know, and uh, except in times of great crisis, and pre prior to World War II, it would have been the Civil War. We've got a handful of questions about how much we spend on the military and how wasteful some of that spending may be, or much of it may be. But before we get to that, I so the way that libertarians often talk about what the government's up to, that we when we talk about you know this particular program is inefficient or it's not accomplishing what it's setting out to. It's spending more than it should and for – we have a, a list of reasons why this sort of thing is typical. But it it feels like people on – I mean both the left and the right and just in general in America talk about the military differently than we talk about other government programs. We treat it as not just that it has a different you know, mission than say the FDA or the Department of Agriculture but that at some fundamental level it's just – a different thing entirely. Is that true and does that impact the way that we critique it? Does, is the military open to the same kinds of critiques that libertarians make against other government agencies, other government programs? The military is subject to the same critiques that libertarians make of other government programs with one crucial exception, which is that nearly everyone, including most libertarians, agree that security is an essential function of government. Um, there is no disputing that the powers granted to the federal government uh, are are about you know security is probably the most important of them. And I like to joke that uh, you know in the Constitution I don't have to search very far to find provisions for. Uh, raising an army, maintaining a navy. I have to search really hard to find the justification for Department of Agriculture. I've yet to find it uh, in, 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 in its strictest sense of the term. So I think that that there are um, – the mere fact that the military is specified, delineated in the document and, and again, the whole purpose of government going back to the founding of governments in human history is about military protection. All of the other things that have come since then, you can – people can justify them and we can, criti we can criticize and scrutinize them. But you find far fewer people who, cri who question the, the role of the state at some basic level in providing security. You find, you find few. You find some. I'm not disputing that. But – because there are so few of them relative to a much larger number who may criticize the Department of Agriculture or the Department of Labor and go on and on and therefore you open up a, a whole panoply of, of critiques of these other agencies that you don't have with respect to the military. Now, other than uh, what, what you mentioned about that, the one different thing about the military being a core function of government, uh, it's, it's internally, it's a bureaucracy that uh, 
overspends and has public choice problems and doesn't do things uh, correctly like other bureaucracies. And it's one of these things that it seems that Republicans think that you can you – can, the government can't run the health care system. But they can set up another country. Right. Correct. That but that's what issue. what I meant in the, the weird, interesting way that we talk about it differently because even if we recognize that, you don't hear people refer to people in the military as bureaucrats. You don't True. you know, you don't get the like, well, of course this particular department has is interested in its own growth and there's all these incentives even at the lowest level to inflate budgets and all that. Like we don't – we act as if the military is more honorable. Um, and we pure. also don't we also don't uh, introduce FDA employees at football games and have them march across <laughs> the field <laughs> right. and everyone applaud right. them as they get right. on airplanes. So right. that's another way we treat them differently. So I, I, I think you've you've both hit on the fact that we we as a society treat members of the military differently than we do members of any other federal agency or department. Um, and I think partly that's a function of this kind of common understanding of the role of, of government. But I also think that it's a function of a kind of uh, a, a culture in American history that's that's evolved and changed over time in a way that I think many of the founders would be, frankly, rather horrified by. Um, the idea of celebrating n not merely – well, the military as an institution but also the individual members of the military. Now, I have to quickly add I'm a, I used to be in the military. I served in the military and uh, you know, absolutely no regrets and I, and I still – support uh, you know, people who, and who choose to join the military. And I think that looking at these individuals on a case-by-case case, case basis, I think many of them do join for the quote-unquote right reasons, which is patriotism and a commitment to service um, in addition to the, the other benefits they derive from, from volunteering, just as I did. I volunteered, but I, they paid for my college. That, that was the deal, right? I was in Navy ROTC. So – but I do think it's interesting and important to draw a distinction between how we how we interpret people's decision to join the military as both a fun function of service and out of self-interested motives, and yet we tend not to ascribe a service uh, you know component to those who join the. <laughs> we're going to pick on the Department of Ag today just for the heck of it. Uh, it's it's the A in the alphabet, um, and. And I think that's worth pondering, right, as a society. I'm not saying that it's right or wrong. I just think it's worth worth talking about. So that's what we're talking about today. It's good. It, it's similar. I think the other professions you get this is are police officers, obviously, which are somewhat mil military-ish, and teachers to some extent too. Mm -hmm. the, the idea that they're heroes, firefighters, or, you know, firefighters, fire, yeah, yeah. Uh, servants of some kind, but right. not not the guy who pushes papers around the Department of Agriculture. That poor guy who's, right. who – the military has those people too. Well, let's go back to the – I wanted to get up to the spending but we kind of broached on it with the wars, the health of the state aspect. We, have, we live in an incredibly – well, we have a very big military and we can explain how big that is. But we haven't always had a big military and I feel like for the 20th century, the, the, the first moment is really – World War I is a pretty big watershed moment or, or maybe before that there's important moments. But you know, do we have a – can we do a rundown of American sure. military history uh, in, in getting to how we got to where we are now? Right. I mean, th of course, the largest war in American history still uh, is the Civil War um, because you have to count both sides if you're counting it accurately. Um, and it resulted in a dramatic expansion of federal power. Um, and it also, I think, planted the seeds for the modern welfare state because the care of veterans but also widows um, formed the kind of the foundation of um, aged families dependent children and, and, and their successors. Um, and again, that's not a phenomenon unique to the United States and most you – know, many other modern industrial countries can point to providing care for veterans and, and widows. Uh, so you can see again why war is the health of the state. However, during World War I, there was a fairly um, systematic and aggressive uh, uh, approach to coordinating resources in a way that was not even – did not occur at the time of the Civil War. And so you, you had the federal government reaching down into industries in a way that it hadn't before. And then – and then I do think that that, that – 
early model from World War I period was rolled out again during World War II a bit easier because they had the practice as it were in the late – in 1917, 1918. Crucially, however, in the 1920s, the United States did dramatically draw down its military. Um, the United States supervised a, a far-reaching – uh, plan for controlling the the arms race of the day, which was naval uh, armaments, um, and so after each major conflict, even though you do have this um, kind of the ratchet effect, as Bob Higgs calls it, of of the government growing and the military acquiring more, but you also, but it's not a perfect ratchet. It actually did click down again after each of the major conflicts. The difference, in in many respects, was World War II where the military became very, very large. I guess at the high point, it was around 12 or 13 million people in uniform roughly. Uh, that number sticks in my head, uh, which is just you know unprecedented uh, in U.S. history. And of course, all the other countries fighting World War II was, it was far greater than that. Um, we actually did draw down after World War II, but then because of the, because of the close uh, – timing of the Cold War, we, we forget that there was a drawdown after World War II, but we remember that basically after Korea, it, it stayed high uh, for the entire Cold War period. Um, and by staying high, we mean that we had a permanent armament industry as Eisenhower famously talked about in his farewell address and that it was unique in American history. Prior to that point in time in the 50s and 60s, um, we did not have uh, large sectors of the U.S. economy that were primarily organized pro around providing implements of war and material for the military. After the onset of the Cold War, that changed, and so you did have a shift in uh, kind of the relate, kind of the, the, the relationships of power in terms of the economic effects and benefits uh, for some sectors of the economy in a way that, that made it hard uh, to to draw down again. Uh, as we had after the wars. And what are the numbers on that now in terms of just the raw numbers? In terms of raw numbers, there are two statistics that I think are, are the most important. The, the advocates for more military spending uh, routinely point to uh, defense spending as a share of GDP. And as a share of GDP, defense spending has been steadily declining uh, since Vietnam. There's an uptick obviously around the time of the Iraq War as you would expect. But the simple fact is the economy has grown so much faster than the rate of growth in the military that – uh, as a share of GDP, it has declined and it now is, is around 3 percent, actually just above 3 percent and projected to go uh, below 3 in the, in the latter half of this decade uh, as compared to 25 percent during World War II and averaged around uh, 10 or 11 percent during the 1950s. So that's a relevant statistic and I think it's, it's important to point that out. The other relevant statistic I think is – uh, real expenditures and inflation-adjusted dollars. And today's military is actually more expensive than the average cost of the military during the Cold War. And this is quite striking. Uh, the military is smaller in terms of numbers of people than it was during the Cold War um, and is smaller in terms of numbers of platforms, ships, planes, etc. Uh, and yet the dollar costs have risen even when you adjust for inflation. And the reasons why are I think fairly obvious. One, we moved away from a draft and so you have to pay people more and you have to give them more benefits in order to, to incentivize them to join and stay. And crucially, we buy fewer plane ships and whatnot but those units have far greater capabilities than the old ones. So it's, it's simply impossible to make a comparison between a modern warship of today and a warship of the 50s or 30s. Um, and so I, I think it's worth sort of pondering the, gr the rate of growth and the growth of, of, of military spending but also to pay attention to the effectiveness, what you're actually getting for what you're paying. Uh, and I think we don't spend nearly enough time talking about that. How much of this increased cost and the amount that we're spending um, – I mean so these things, these, these warships, these planes, these are being made by private industry. And you talked about how this this rise of a permanent private industry supplying the military is relatively new. How much of the the massive size of our military, the massive cost of our military, is driven by the existence of that sector? So obviously that sector really wants to sell more planes and sell more expensive planes, and so is out there talking 
generals and other folks into, you know, what you really need is this thing that's super expensive. So how much of it's driven by that and how much of it is driven by people in government, people in the military saying we need planes and ships that have these capabilities no matter the cost or we need to be spending more? Aaron's question reminds me of the fact that when I go to work every day on the metro. I live in a place called Pentagon City, which as you might guess is right next to the Pentagon. And in the metro, they have ads for F-35s because <laughs> you might want to take them home with take you. It's, it's, there's, right. something, there's something that says a lot about that. The people walking by, it's like you know, Lockheed Martin, like, you right. know, protecting America. I was like, who are they selling this to? Right. But I think, well, you. Know, you. See, exactly, it registered exactly, with you. Right? Exactly. Exactly. Right. Um, the answer, Aaron, is uh, both. Uh, that you have a um, an industry that has grown up around providing for the military and it has learned certain skills uh, that allow it to continue selling to the U.S. military and it's gotten very good at it. Uh, and there are a handful of companies that are extraordinarily dependent upon military spending above all else. They do not have um, you know, an appreciable uh, domestic or commercial segment at all. Um, but there is also the problem – but they cannot impose requirements on the, the military and the procurement officers or whatnot. The requirements ultimately are established by, um, by civilians, by the, by the civilian leadership and I think this is a crucial question. It's like not what are we asking our you – know, what is it we ask our military to do? What do we expect it to do? Um, and so for all the talk – and there's – there you can just imagine there's a lot about reforming the military, reducing its costs and whatnot, everyone goes back to the same thing. We have a problem with requirements creep, that requirements grow, there's not enough uh, pressure or incentives to, to limit the growth, cost growth, et cetera, and yet no one has come up with a, with a workable solution to this problem. Therefore, uh, partly just out of practical considerations, you know, myself and Ben Friedman and others of us here at Cato who work mostly on defense policy issues, we do tend to focus more on the rationales than on the implementation, right? More on the big picture questions than, uh, you know, is the F-35 worth it? Which I've also written about. Um, but you can know, you give me the crib sheet on that one? Uh, the crib sheet is <laughs> no. <laughs> no. The crib sheet is no. The, embar the really truly embarrassing part of this is that once upon a time, I thought the answer was yes. Um, so you all can look – you can go and look to search for my paper on the Joint Strike Fighter and say, wow, Preble, Preble got that one badly wrong. Um, but anyway, the, there are so many different elements of this vast military machine um, that and, – and again, no shortage of people scrutinizing each, of one, each one of those elements. I think the most important part for us, for me and, and for, for those of us here at Cato is really to focus on the big picture. What are we doing? Why are we doing it? Are we, the United States of America, the US military, the only ones who can? And if you, if you explore those much bigger questions, much harder questions, then you actually could generate pretty substantial savings because you're talking about a very, very different military than the one we have today. Trevor Well, then let's turn to those questions because you – if you listen to politicians talk and especially politicians on the right, um, you get the sense that, OK, so yeah, our, our military is very expensive. It's very large but we need that because this is a dangerous world. Um, the, the good guys except for the United States are relatively weak militarily, have small militaries. Um, the, the bad guys are either of the sort that you need a big military to – stop them because they're everywhere or they have big militaries themselves like China. Um, and so if if we don't have this, then the world is going to be in serious trouble. Right. Let's let's bracket China just for a minute. OK. We're going to treat that as its own. I have a question special. just let's, about we're, China. We're so that's a, good. It's good. We're going to put that off to the side. I think this is the crux of the debate between those of us who advocate what we call restraint or offshore balancing or something like that, non-interventionism and everyone else, OK? Everyone else believes that uh, international order hinges on American military power uh, ultimately. They, they agree that there are other things that are important but when it really comes down to brass tacks, it's about the ability of the US military to fight and win wars because others are weak. Our friends are weak. The good guys are weak. And because they claim the bad guys are really strong. 
bracketing China for the moment, the rest of the guys are not strong. They're actually quite, quite weak. It has been, especially this past week, it has been truly disconcerting to realize how much time and effort we have spent talking about Iran, a country with a truly inept military in, in every sense of the word at a time when, the chi when China, the second largest economy in the world, is sucking the entire world down potentially into yet another you know, economic catastrophe. But then there's the question – the other side of the issue is why are the good guys weak? Why are our friends weak? They're not that weak, right? Even if you talk about Japan, which is the third largest economy in the world and they spend only 1 percent of their GDP on defense, 1 percent of the third largest economy in the world is a lot of money and they actually have a pretty capable military, uh, all things considered. Our NATO allies don't spend as much as I think they should or certainly as much as they could. But they're not militarily weak. They're not militarily weak when compared even to Russia, which looks big and strong but which is not big and strong. My argument is that to the extent that this, our friends are not particularly strong or more importantly, not inclined to use their power, it's because we've discouraged them from doing so. And I think that if we thought more seriously about burden shifting, not merely burden sharing, we would see them play a greater role in their respective regions and ultimately be in a stronger position to help us when we need it. Last point on this. When we embarked on this project of discouraging other countries from defending themselves after World War II, I think it made a lot of sense. We were really strong and they were not. And they were not in a position to stand up to the Soviet Union and not long afterwards uh, the People's Republic of China. But now they're rich and they are certainly capable of standing up to these countries, especially collectively, not one by one, all you know, each on their own. And so I think we're in a different time today than we were certainly 25 years ago at the end of the Cold War uh, or 50 years ago. Um, and yet we haven't revisited this basic bargain, the basic bargain being we agree to defend them, they agree to let us. And if I were in their position, I'd do exactly the same thing. Should we be afraid of a more militarized world, a more equitably militarized world, uh, creating a World War I type situation? I mean, should we be afraid of a militarized Germany or, we, or, or is the codependency in trade and economically just too big right now? I certainly believe that the codependency in trade and other factors is uh, greater today than it was even at the time of World War I. People pointed out at the time of World War I, the two leading trading countries were Germany and, and the UK, Great Britain. And so uh, trade did not prevent them from going to war with one another. And so you can certainly overdo the argument that economic interdependence prevents war. Uh, but I do think that the costs of going to war have risen dramatically in large measure because of economic interdependence and other things like nuclear weapons, which we shouldn't look past. The other factor which didn't exist at the time of World War I or even uh, uh, certainly at, at the time of World War I is people just didn't appreciate the – just how horrific war actually was. They'd sort of forgotten. They had fought some cheap short wars in the – in the 1870s and 1880s and they sort of forgot just how Franco, bad it, the Franco right, right, it, it, it lasted a couple of weeks yeah. and people are like, oh, well, this is, this is a piece of cake. Um, and, and so just the, the collective experience of war, especially in Europe and Asia, was so uh, devastating that I think it raised the cost. People kind of, kind of acquired a new appreciation for the cost of going to war, which seemed on the surface that could not possibly outweigh whatever benefits they would derive. And then you add to that nuclear weapons, which is you know, to, you know turns it up to eleven. Um, so the, the bottom line is, I don't fear arms races in the same way that I would have in an earlier era. Um, but I also think that. Some measure of self-defense and, and is more credible over time than a single country pledging to defend every country forever. Again, it was a, I think it was a perfectly reasonable argument to make in the in the fifties and sixties, uh, but it becomes harder and harder to sustain over time. To think that the American people will treat an attack on Poland, no disrespect to my Polish friends, as the same way they would to Portland, where I grew up. Right? I mean, these are, it's it's harder and harder to believe that Americans will treat 
that. And I think it's harder and harder to believe that polls will believe that Americans will treat it that way. And I think that drives in the direction of more self-reliance, more self-help, uh, which is one of the classic uh, kind of realist uh, components of realist thinking in international relations. Uh, your point about forgetting the destruction of war is fascinating to me because – I've, I notice a trend in studying history that at the beginning of many wars, people think that A, it's going to be easy and B, possibly even fun. Uh, that was definitely World War I kind of like – you know, the British is like, oh, let's go off to the continent and give Jerry a drumming and we'll be home by Christmas kind of or thing. camping out on the hills to watch To watch the Battle of Manassas right. or, uh, or even Iraq. I mean, mm -hmm. That's uh, I think probably Vietnam, and maybe that's a, a theme we can talk about. That especially with a, with our vision of our own military might, that any war we should be able to win with one arm tied behind our back, to the point that we're literally watching the bombing of a city on the news and like enjoying ours. I mean, this is pretty depraved type. It's of, a spectator uh, sport. It's become a spectator sport because yeah. so few people, so few Americans are affected by it directly. So. Yeah, and, and so we can push buttons and military action is – we have fewer casualties here because we're killing people with lasers or whatever. In the <laughs> not, moment, not yet. Not yet. That's coming. Soon enough and then we're, and then we're watching <laughs> right. these things on – and we're all thinking it's easy and this seems like a very dangerous mindset and, and one that's historically – has a long historic history to it. Yes, and so the, the wars on the surface, they get easier because of technology but then when they're actually fought and the, you know, we're reminded that war at the end of the day is about killing people and breaking things. Um, and uh, to achieve to achieve victory, to achieve a political end, um, and I do think uh, I, I think it's worth pondering the kind of technological uh, advances in in unmanned vehicles like drones and, and things like that, um, which further reduce the likelihood of Americans being killed, not just American citizens because they're virtually never subject to to harm during warfare, but even not, not risking the lives of, of American pilots any longer. Um, and so if war becomes too easy, we don't talk about it enough, um, then I think that um, is worth – again, it's worth pondering. It doesn't say that it's never right. Uh, but I do think we have a, we have a, a, a challenge in, in that so few people are directly affected by the wars we wage. I have a good trivia question for you then, and also for listeners. Who was the last person to invade the United States? Pancho Villa. P Pancho Villa. That's very good. That's yes. very good. I always, that, I always tell that story. People remember who that one is. Yeah. How do we counter that then? Because I mean so the obvious one would be, well, then let's start sending ordinary Americans <laughs> off to witness <laughs> right. wars. But that right. doesn't seem like a terribly good idea and we probably don't want to roll back the technology that allows us to fight wars with fewer casualties to Americans. So right. is there a way to this – because it does seem like there's this Tension. American cultural trend of – like to a troubling degree, a lot of Americans seem to think violence is awesome, um, and that it's it's fun, and that you know we we see this in the issues around policing too. Mm -hmm. Like the busting heads is cool, and um, and we the way we glorify the military and the excitement we get at watching the bombing campaigns on the news does seem profoundly troubling, and it allows people to like really militaristic candidates to stir up support by basically promising to go to war. Um, so how do we how do we fight that in a non-destructive way? Well, I do think we, we shouldn't look past the, the impact of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan on American public sentiments because I think that, that, that unlike the first Gulf War where people thought that every war is going to be like the first Gulf War which lasts you know, a couple weeks or a couple hours depending upon how you count it. Um, Iraq and Afghanistan have reminded us that wars are really hard. Winning decisively is really hard even against small, weak countries like Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, but that does not prevent candidates from saying, I would have fought the war better or I will fought the next war better. Uh, and you see a sort of you know, um, ebb and flow of public sentiments towards warfare as they get farther and farther away from the last horrible one that was fought. But ultimately, I think the answer is – much greater discipline on the part of our leaders and that's not a very satisfying answer because it really does hinge on, a, on a, a fairly small number of people acting in a responsible way because the simple fact is that foreign policy is not particularly salient to most Americans. It is not a very high priority for them and therefore they're not going to hold politicians to account um, uh, you know, at, at the ballot box um, except in very rare instances. Um, but 
uh, because we're entrusting a, f uh, a small number of men and women with enormous power, I think there is a great responsibility for them to wield it in a responsible way. And what I've suggested and others have suggested is some set of criteria that describe the circumstances when the United States will go to war. And they don't have to be so limiting that there's there's never – you know, you don't want to signal to the enemy – the argument is you don't want to signal to the enemy too clearly when you will or will not use force. So it's really a set of criteria, a set of considerations, you know, when, when should you use force. And I – you know, I've proposed some. The Weinberger-Powell doctrine from many years ago is still kicking around. And so – What is that? The one, it was a set of criteria, uh, Casper Weinberger, who was Ronald Reagan's secretary of defense um, uh, after Vietnam but especially after the, the Beirut uh, bombings in uh, 1982, 83 uh, said we will you know, lay down a set of criteria that include you know, we'll have a clear, uh, a clear national interest, there would be a clear military mission, uh, that uh, there's – we use overwhelming force, there's strong support for it and, and that set of criteria like that, Colin Powell who was Weinberger's aide at the time then adapted that even further when he was national security advisor. Um, so it, it's just – it's a list of criteria. Uh, you know, I think it – my own list that I used in my book, The Power Problem, is, is derived from that. It's a pretty small it's, – it's a short list. It's, you know, let's have a debate about what national interest is being served by this military operation. Let's understand what the military mission is. How do you define it? When do we know we're done? Uh, how much is it going to cost? Let's have a you know reasonable attempt to, uh, to estimate the cost ahead of time. Um, uh, is it supported by the public? And and this is a rather banal point, but I but I'll make it is that just because we have the ability to wage war anytime at any place doesn't mean we should. And so you really should you know again go the extra mile to ensure that it's the last resort that you have exhausted all other means. Um, and. You know, I think my criteria are fairly stringent, but I've heard more stringent, and so let's ha let's let's talk about that. But right now, I mean, candidly, there is no criteria, and what that means is because we have so much power, and because we know that that there will be very little uh, accountability back here at home if something goes horribly wrong seven or eight thousand miles away. Um, we sort of kind of meander from from intervention to intervention and and it's not clear after the fact you know why did we intervene there but not over over here uh, and I think it it's created just a sense of confusion around the world, not really knowing if 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 the if it's true if the other side is correct that international security hinges on u on the exercise of u s power then then that's a real problem. I say we have a single point of failure. This is not a resilient system. This is too heavily dependent upon one country that is um, unpredictable, uh, and and I think that's why ultimately we're trying to trying to fashion an international order that was somewhat less dependent upon international U.S. military power is, is the ultimate object of, of my foreign policy and that of my colleagues. You you mentioned the word previously a few minutes ago, non-intervention, and and we have a question on here of non-intervention, and then of course the word. Isolationism. Um, you kind of describe what your foreign policy is, but would would any of those words apply, or, or especially the word isolationism, which is I think mostly an epithet? But what do you, what do you usually hear when you when someone says isolationist? When I hear the word isolationist, it is an epithet. It's a, it's a word that's used to shut down consideration of alternatives. Um, it's reasonably effective because it's associated with. Um, a period in U.S. history when the inclination against intervention, it is, it was, it is believed, uh, led to the rise of a, um, a a truly global threat. Nazi Germany, you know, aligned with Imperial Japan. Um, I think that in the modern context, the isolationist epithet is it implies a reluctance to engage in the world in any fashion. This goes back to the answer I gave at the, at, right at the top of the hour, uh, which is we believe in trade. We believe that, uh, in, in welcoming people here. We, we believe in encouraging Americans to go abroad uh, in search of opportunities or cultural experiences, tourism, et cetera, education, um, and that a true isolationist would reject that would believe that the United States is a large enough country and a, a robust enough country that it did not need interaction with the rest of the world. There's a, pretty much North Korea. There's a reason – I mean there is a not 
crazy argument to be made that this is a really large country. We have a huge population. We have vast resources. We can do it on our own. That's not the kind of country I want to live in um, because I believe that we are made better as a country when we are engaged internationally. I believe I personally am and I believe that we as a society are. So the key to differentiating uh, non-interventionist mil – mil you know, military policy, a foreign policy of non-intervention and an engaged cosmopolitan foreign policy that I embrace is to differentiate you know, when the military instrument is used. That's why I spend so much time talking about the wars we fight and recognizing that there's so much more to U.S. foreign policy than the wars we fight. Unfortunately, because we focus so much on those wars, it sort of it, – it obscures or it causes us to look past these other things. Um, I think there is still a a component of – we know that the American public is, is very reluctant to engage in wars because of Iraq and Afghanistan. We also know that they're not bought into this uh, – the, the political science term is hegemonic or a primacy or the dominant military power. Pick your term that the United States is the world's policeman, whatever. We know that the American public really isn't bought into that. Um, the trouble is that a, a fair number of Americans are also not bought into trade and immigration. So we need, you know, we have some work to do there. Um, and I do think, again, that's why that what di that's one of the key points that differentiates uh, Cato's approach to foreign policy and that of a genuine isolationist, someone who's trying to make the case for the United States to seal itself off from the rest of the world. And that is absolutely not what we're trying to do. Listening to the debate inside the Beltway, um, where we unfortunately, I guess they're having this conversation. Um, yours is we'll called a minority position, it feels like. Um, and, and there's this, this strong sense that when we talk about a candidate who's serious about foreign policy issues or, or the serious people having these discussions, what that tends to mean is something that looks much more militaristic than what you're articulating, that it's a, a willingness to use violence is simply what it means to be serious about something. Um, Given all that, I guess the, the question is why is your position a minority one? Like why are all these people – if most of these people disagree with you, why is that? Most of the people here in Washington disagree with me but most of the people in Washington are not like most of the people outside of the Beltway. Um, and we, we were all smiling at that and we know it's true, right? So there's a selection bias in the kinds of people who are drawn to come here. They, they want to do something and this is, not, this is not unique or particular to foreign policy at all, right? If you believe in making you – know, in, in improving health care and you doubt that the private sector is going to do it, you're going to come to, the, to Washington or you're going to come so, – so you have an interventionist bias among all the people who come here to Washington to work. Then on top of that, you have – um, a alignment of interests around the military and around providing for defense that is quite different from that for other public policy issues. An example that, that Ben Friedman likes to use is that virtually every public policy issue has a point counterpoint. So gun policy, right? You have the Brady people versus the NRA, right? Or you know, uh, regulations governing smoking in restaurants. You have public health advocates versus bar owners, right? So virtually every domestic public policy issue we debate has competing interests that that fight really quite vehemently because they're defending a principle that they believe in very much or that they're harmed by economically. That doesn't exist when you're talking about defense, because the harms that come are felt by others elsewhere. Uh, and the costs are very, very low, uh, relatively speaking. And the costs are especially low. And then when you factor in the f that, that a number of people believe just sort of instinctively in the mission of the military and then are even less likely to criticize it, there, there you have a confluence of influence, uh, interests that make it very, very hard to argue against it. And yet, having said that, I am genuinely encouraged at times by the – sort of common sense of the public outside of the Beltway um, when they raise serious questions about a military operation or the, you know, the, the suggestion the United States should use force and they ask 
you know, reasonable questions like how long is this going to take? How likely is it to work? Who are our, who are our friends? How do we know they're our friends? Why do we think they're our friends? How likely is it we think that our friends are going to win? What happens if they win and they turn out to not be our friends? Those sorts of questions you hear from the American people in some fashion, sort of, you know, maybe not articulated just that way, but it's it's underneath the surface. And so I think that trying to mobilize those those sensible sentiments um, uh, is important. It's a big part of what we try to do here by educating uh, the public. But also it's about educating people who are trying to appeal to the public, politicians, and say, gee, you are one of, I don't know, 18, 20, 22 different people running for a president at any one time and 21 of them all are hawks or various versions of hawk. Maybe if you were the one person who wasn't, maybe you'd be speaking to this sensible center outside of the public. You know, it's a hard sell, and ultimately, at the end of the day, it's hard because, as I said, and I'll say again, foreign policy is not particularly salient. People don't vote for candidates on the basis of their their opposition or support for the war in Syria or the war in Libya, um, and therefore, you need to have a, a, a sufficient you know, kind of grounding in those other issues that people care about to also sell them on your foreign policy vision. And so far, we haven't found a person or a group of people who are able to articulate that combination of positions to win. You've articulated a, a complex view of, of how foreign policy should be done, which is good. A lot of people seem to articulate, you know, fairly simplistic views or, or accuse us of having simplistic views like isolationism. It also seems to me that every single foreign policy instance is very unique to itself. Uh, well, every single issue, for example, Syria or Libya, or, they're all very unique that it would be hard to have a one-size-fits-all philosophy for taking them down. But you, you, but you can have principles about our interests and uh, what we're going to try and get done and things you articulate. So when you think about an issue like ISIS, for example, um, and you're not going to say, well, we either have to destroy them or not. I mean, it's more complex than that. How do you approach a question like ISIS right. um, in terms of how you analyze what should we be doing? Trump right. says we burn their oil fields. Right. Trump says right. they burn their oil fields. Um, Is that really what he said? Oh my gosh. <laughs> <Another thing. laughs> um, he said crazier things. I mean, <laughs> That's I, true. Um, I think that. We, because we have this enormous power and we have we, we perceive that we're able to use it at low cost, um, not using it in the face of just extreme brutality, depravity, you know, even dare I say it, evil, um, seems a little petty, right? Seems a little callous, and so I think that it's entirely appropriate that the United States, in conjunction with others on the ground try to contain and ultimately destroy uh, ISIS. The problem is that doing it is actually quite hard and the, the United States by ourselves certainly could not do it. Um, and more importantly, so then you, then you ask the question, well, if, if – and you couldn't do it quickly, right? It would take a long time. Um, so what would it take to destroy it and is it in our interest to do it by ourselves and how long are we prepared to do that? And, and again, I think that's why ISIS is complicated because it's a political problem, right? The fact that this organization has grown up and has acquired um, territory and adherents and followers and whatnot is because they're, they have a message that is appealing to some of the people on the ground, as, as, as reprehensible as it is to all of us. Um, and solving that problem requires fixing the politics of Iraq and Syria at least. Um, and I don't think that's in our power to do. I think we should have learned that lesson from the Iraq war and not everyone has. So what that means just as a practical matter is I think attacking ISIS in particular instances when they make themselves a convenient target is entirely appropriate but that we shouldn't confuse that with solving the problem, right? Those are two different things. So uh, if we kill Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, great, right? Better that he's gone. Uh, you know, no, shed no tear for, the, for this guy. Uh, but don't, don't believe that by picking off these, these people, you're going to solve this problem forever and I, I just don't think that's true. Um, ultimately, I do think – and this kind of gets back to my ar earlier argument about who is best positioned to fight these sorts of wars – 
it's not the United States and the American people who are six or 7,000 miles away. It's the people who are in the neighborhood who have much more to lose uh, from these. And, and you know, So the simplest way of saying this is ISIS has lots of enemies and we should keep it that way. Right? Uh, we should not give any of their various enemies reason to fear them less than they fear us, uh, which is something that's definitely happened in the United States over time and other outside powers. Um, and so, kind of helping to keep to maintain this very loose coalition of groups who are trying to contain ISIS's rise is entirely appropriate. Uh, but going farther than that, I think is is it doesn't fit with with the interests of U.S. foreign policy. It seems like that. What else, what is a lot of that lesson I'm hearing is sort of a, a humility about what can be done, which yes. it, which it seems like that's a, a good libertarian lesson about government in general believing what can be done effectively, what can't be done effectively. Right. But we have a pretty bad track record of not being very humble about what we can do militarily, whether it's something like the Cuban or the uh, Bay of Pigs, right, Bay of Pigs. Uh, or, or you know, Iraq. So just a little bit more humility and also not overextending yourself and creating enemies because that's another concern, correct? Right. I mean to, there are two points there that I want to pick up on. The first is there's, there is genuinely something endearing um, to American exceptionalism. That is the idea that we can do absolutely anything. As an American, I, th I find it just sort of – it's sort of gratifying. It's, it's like, like watching we, a toddler we, who thinks we can, can just do, do anything. anything and, I, and, I, and I love that about my country, right? But even though then, we're really wrong about that. Even though sometimes we are really wrong about that. And so, there, so kind of uh, appreciating this can-do spirit – uh, while at the same time saying, OK, it's great that you have this sense that you can do absolutely anything. Um, just in case you may not be right, here's, a, here's plan B and C, right? Here's how you hedge against uh, you know, being badly wrong. And this is the kind of, kind of conversation you don't have with a toddler but you do have with an adult, right? You have an adult conversation with the American people who are adults, right? We don't do it that often enough. The other point you, you mentioned, which which is even which is related, but it, but is that there are there are definitely instances in which uh, the U.S. the conduct of U.S. foreign policy um, has created uh, has created enemies or created people who who resent us, right? Um, and but talking about that is is hard. It's it's awkward because it it appears that you're you're criticizing your country and like why don't you love your country? So I think that just how you talk about it is really important and, and for me, it's recognizing that most of the time, uh, people are motivated, American policymakers are motivated with good intentions. They're actually – they're trying to do the right thing but sometimes they get it wrong and understanding why they get it wrong and kind of accepting their intentions as, as good or, you know, or on the surface, they're trying to advance U.S. interests. Um, and then criticizing or scrutinizing their conduct on those terms is more productive than starting from the presumption that they had bad intentions from the very beginning. Um, and I think it is possible to criticize the conduct of U.S. foreign policy on those grounds. That is, the intentions were good but they, the execution was flawed and here's why because you actually will learn from that and apply it to future. So we just published a book. It's just coming out by Ted Carpenter, Ted Yellen Carpenter and Malou Innocent on our relationships with uh, undemocratic and unsavory regimes over the years called Perilous Partners. Perfect example of this, right? There is that occasionally you have to make deals with the devil, most important of course, fighting with Joseph Stalin to defeat Nazi Germany, which was horrible and yet was the right thing to do, right? Um, because Joseph Stalin was was a horrible guy, but you know, pick your poison. Um, and yet, not every autocratic ruler that we <laughs> we we ally with fits that category. That and so therefore, kind of being much more discerning in terms of when we engage with these undemocratic uh, r r rulers, corrupt rulers, uh, that's something we need to we need to get better at uh, as a country. Free thoughts is produced by Evan Banks and Mark McDaniel. To learn more about libertarianism and the ideas that influence it, visit us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.